Many self-help books are a bit like trains. They travel a pre-established route toward a known destination. The journey's all planned out, and the book in your hands, or on your screen, is your ticket. All you have to do is get on and enjoy the ride. And you know what? That's often the best way to travel. I mean, you don't always need to figure everything out for yourself. Good advice from experts can be the fastest way to get where you want to go. For example, I generally try to eat a balanced and nutritious diet. It keeps me healthy and energetic, and I tend to be more productive and in a better mood when I pass on the chili cheese fries and opt for the spinach salad. But being healthy and energetic isn't really my life goal. It's more like a means to an end. It helps me do other things that I care about. So I don't really need to know everything about nutrition. I don't need to know why spinach is good for me. I can reap the rewards of healthy eating, energy, productivity, and all that by doing what the experts say I should do. These blinks to How to Begin by Michael Bungay Stanier take a different approach. Unlike most self-help experts, Bungay Stanier doesn't merely offer instructions for how to live your life. Bungay Stanier understands that no one can tell us what matters to us. We have to beat our own paths, because the path that leads you to deep fulfillment might be a dead end for me, and vice versa. In other words, these blinks are not a train ticket. They don't identify a final destination that we all should aim for. We each have our own personal destinations, our own goals. Precisely what those goals are will vary person to person. What shouldn't vary, however, is the qualities those goals possess. It's the qualities that your goals possess, not what your goals are, that will make them, to quote Bungay Stanier, worthy goals. If this is starting to sound complicated, don't worry, I'll explain everything in the next blink. Life is short, and as far as we know, we only get one shot at it. There isn't time to pursue dead ends. That's why we owe it to ourselves to get these big goals right. And that's exactly what we're going to do in these blinks. I'm Brian, and I'll be walking you through the tools that can help you plot a path toward your worthy goal. So worthy goals possess certain qualities. To get even more specific, they possess three distinctive qualities. Every worthy goal should be daunting, important, and thrilling. To get a better grasp on this, let's look at a person's life. We'll follow him from boyhood to adulthood, and as his life unfolds, let's see if his life goal possesses those three qualities, if it's truly a worthy goal. Listener, meet Paul. Paul is a sweet, sensitive, intelligent boy. He does well in school. He studies hard. In his spare time, he loves to draw, to play piano, and to daydream. By the time he's 18, when it's time to head off to college, he has lots of options. His parents, pragmatic people with their heads very much not in the clouds, gently urge him to choose a safe career, and sweet, sensitive Paul, not wanting to disappoint his family, acquiesces. He goes to med school does exceptionally well, and becomes a doctor. And his job is fine. It's definitely not boring. He has to solve new problems every day. He's constantly learning and improving. It's also valuable, not just in terms of his paycheck, though that's definitely a factor. Paul believes that one should be of service, that one should give to the world more than one takes from it. He often reminds himself of this. He's proud to be of service to others, though he's not necessarily burning with passion for his work. So here's the question. Does the goal that Paul has spent his life pursuing, the life that he has chosen for himself, count as a worthy goal? It's definitely daunting. There are new challenges every day, life and death situations requiring great mental and moral strength. It pushes him, expands his limits, keeps him evolving, which is what a daunting goal should do. And it's obviously important. He's serving others in the most dramatic way possible. 
saving lives. He's giving back, improving the world in a palpable way, which is what it means for a goal to be important. But is it thrilling? Remember, all worthy goals possess three qualities, and being thrilling is the third. It should be exciting. It should speak to your values. It should be bold, fun, something you don't have to do, but that you want to do. And here's the thing. Paul has an itch. Deep down, he feels that being a doctor is not good enough. Something's missing. He just can't put his finger on what that something is. Maybe you feel the same way. And look, we can do better than ticking two out of three boxes. Imagine a three-legged stool with one leg shorter than the others. Can you use it? Well, yeah, sure, it works. But it's always going to be uncomfortable to sit on, and it'll never hold the full weight of your ambition and talent. So how can we improve that wobbly three-legged stool? Let's keep that image in mind as we move into the next blink. Making a stool, real or metaphorical, is like making anything else. It starts with an idea, a design. And it doesn't matter where that idea comes from. What matters is that the idea is there. Okay, let's get practical and do an exercise together. Think of an idea for a life project you want to work on. We're going to get that idea out of your head and into the world. In order to do that, we have to start with a sketch. It doesn't need to be a completely fleshed out concept. It doesn't need to be a masterpiece. It just needs to be on paper, tangible, real. It'll be messy. It'll be a little vague, even a bit crappy, but that's okay. Let's make that crappy first draft. A crappy first draft is good enough for now because nailing our worthy goals at the first attempt is pretty much impossible. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. Often, like Paul, we just can't find the right words to pin down what's missing. But don't get too philosophical about it. Make quick word associations and move on. For example, if your goal is go to bed at 10 p.m. every night, you could jot down the following. Early night equals early start equals more energy over the day equals more energy after work equals more time for X, Y, and Z project. So make quick word associations for your goal and move on. Give yourself 10 minutes for this task. Remember to aim for a goal that's worthy of your time. So when you're writing it down, ask yourself if it's daunting, important, and thrilling, the three qualities that all worthy goals have. Is it something that's going to push you out of your comfort zone without being impossible? Is it going to connect you to the world in some way? Does it excite you? Keep those word associations flowing and see how far you can get. After 10 minutes of this, see if you can put it all together into one short mission statement. When the author did this, the mission statement he came up with was create a new top-notch podcast. Is your mission statement going to be perfect? No, probably not. But it is a start. All right, well done. You've got your first draft down. Now it's time to put your worthy goal through its paces. Think of this as a stress test. How sturdy is it? Does it support the weight of your ambition? Or does it look like it's going to wobble? We can figure that out by subjecting it to the spouse-ish test. Here's what that means. You're going to run your idea past the person who knows you best. It's spouse-ish because it doesn't have to be an actual spouse. It could be your best friend or your sister or your partner. Point is, there's someone who's heard it all. Your jokes, your dreams and ideals, your hang-ups. They have a sense of who you are what you stand for, and where you are in life. They know you, and they care about you. Your sketch is still on paper. It sounds great, but it's still abstract. It could easily stay there, tucked away in a drawer, but you're going to change that. You're going to both make yourself accountable and give yourself a reality check. Scary? Sure. Necessary? Absolutely. 
We all have our blind spots. Catching problems early is going to save you a lot of heartache later on. So what can you expect? Chances are you're going to hear one of three things from your spouse-ish person. Yes, brilliant, do it. No, that's nuts. Don't do it. Or, yeah, it's a great idea, but you've been talking about it forever. Just do it already. Be on the lookout for extreme reactions. Positive feedback isn't a green light, but it is a great sign that you're on the right track. Nor is a negative response a red light. It's simply a warning telling you to check you haven't missed something important. That brings us to the second test. Fitting your project into the Goldilocks zone. If you know the fairy tale Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you'll remember a little girl trying three bowls of porridge. One was too hot. Another too cold. The third, though, was just right. In astronomy, there's what's called the Goldilocks zone. It's the part of space near a star where a planet's water remains liquid. If a planet's too close to the star, the water boils off. If it's too far away, the water freezes. In the Goldilocks zone, you have liquid water, the precondition of life as we understand it. Some goals are too small and granular. Being in bed by 10 p.m. is a good example. Others, like finding happiness, are too big, too abstract. What you're looking for is a goal that feels just right. Your project should fit into a Goldilocks zone, which is why this exercise is called the Goldilocks test. You're looking for that perfect balance. Meaningful, but realistic. Inspiring, but doable. So how did your worthy goal fare after the stress tests? Still wobbly? No worries. Just go back to the sketch and make the necessary tweaks. Let's recap. You've run your first draft past a spousish person, so it's out there in the world. You've also thought about its weight and heft. Can it be done? Is it worth doing? Did your goal pass these stress tests? Yes? Great. You're ready to start working on your final draft. Here's how. There's a restaurant in Toronto that the author loves. It rates its dishes with a heat scale that stretches from 1 to 20, or from mild to crazy hot. What precisely does this chili scale have to do with anything? Well, you can also measure your worthy goal on a similar scale. You don't want it to be insanely spicy, that's too much sweat and pain, but it can probably do with a little bit of an extra kick. Amping up the power of your goal is often as easy as adding a single word or short phrase to your mission statement. And that's our next exercise. You'll want to give yourself around 15 minutes. You'll also need pen and paper, the notes app on your phone, or anything else that you could write with. Ready? Okay, here we go. How can you add some spice to your draft? Let's look at the kinds of words you could add. For starters, let's consider time. Think about when you're going to be working on your goal. Is it a full-time commitment, for example, or more like five hours a week? Deadlines also give you lots of choices. By tomorrow, within four weeks, by the end of the year, by 2040, before I die? Next, ask yourself how you're going to work. Will it be with a team or alone? Willingly? Joyfully? Passionately? All in? What about your project's reach? Is it geared toward the place you live or an international audience? Do you want 1,000 local customers or 10 million global subscribers? You can also consider outcomes. There's lots of descriptors to choose from. Think profitable, sustainable, helpful lucrative, freeing, or fulfilling. You can aim to be in the top 10, 5, or 3%. Your goal can be transformative or a bestseller. It can be recognized or loved or valued. Then there's standards. Are you professional, extraordinary, or elite? Too high-flown? What about competent or just good enough? 
While you were adding all that extra spice, how did your mission statement change? Those vague descriptors from your crappy first draft should have started to firm up and become more precise. Remember the author's crappy first draft, Create a New Top-Notch Podcast? Well, when he refashioned his draft after going through this exercise, he liked the word new. It's precise and meaningful. Top-notch was too vague. It had to go. After experimenting with more adjectives and adverbs, he tried qualifying the time and outcome of his project. And he ended up with, launch a new podcast that is in the top 3% of all podcasts within 12 months. That's his final draft. It's a lot tighter, right? Keep playing around and see if you can make your mission statement just as impactful. You've got your final draft. It's exciting, meaningful, challenging, maybe a bit scary. That's good. It's supposed to be daunting after all. You're almost ready to commit. But there's one last test to run. The American artist Gary Larson, creator of the Far Side comic strip, has a cartoon of a paunchy moose slumped in front of the TV on a beaten up old armchair, beer in hand. He's the perfect picture of stuck in a rut, albeit in animal form. His moose wife has just answered the phone. With her hand covering the phone's microphone, she tells him, it's the call of the wild. The joke, of course, is that no one is less likely to respond to the wild's call than Larson's chair-bound moose. But what about you? Are you going to answer? Will you take on this goal or let the opportunity pass you by? It's not nice to think about that possibility, but it's a vital part of this journey. And the thing is, there are reasons to ignore that call. Yes, the status quo has its rewards, but staying in your comfort zone also has its costs. In our final exercise, you'll be stacking those rewards and costs up against each other. Let's start with the rewards. The biggest reward of maintaining the status quo is that you get to keep what you have. Now, that looks different for each of us, but the themes are usually pretty similar. You get to keep the comfort, status, and authority that you've built up over the years. You stay in control. If you don't try something new, you can't fail. You're not going to disappoint yourself or others. It's safe, tried and true, comfortable. The downside is that none of those things are going to unlock your greatness. To do that, you have to work on the hard things, risk something, enter unfamiliar terrain. So let's get on to the exercise. Start by asking yourself how you benefit from not taking on your worthy goal. You might find that the status quo lets you keep your options open. Or maybe it's money or status that you're afraid of losing. Or your project might force you to admit that you don't know as much about something as you like to think. Maybe it allows you to keep telling yourself a comforting story, like success being down to blind luck, not hard work. Give yourself 10 minutes and list all the rewards in a column. This is pretty hard work, but keep at it, keep digging you're going to unearth some powerful stuff. Once you've got those rewards down on paper, create a second column. This is where you're going to list all the costs of not pursuing your worthy goal. What happens if, like Larson's moose, you don't answer the call? What opportunities are you foregoing? It might be the chance to meet interesting people or master skills that lead to more fulfilling work. Or it could be that you'll resign yourself to the idea that you've already peaked. Give yourself another 10 minutes. Now that you've filled these two columns, pick the three biggest rewards and the three biggest costs. How do they stack up? Which way does the balance tip? You can do this part of the exercise in your head. You might find that the whole thing is pretty much redundant. You already know the answer. That could go one of two ways. If the rewards outweigh the costs, don't worry. It's much better to find that out now rather than weeks or months or years into a project that wasn't quite right for you. 
If that's where you find yourself, take the off-ramp and circle back to the beginning of the process. Rethink your goal. Does it need a few tweaks, or do you want to pick a new aspiration? If, on the other hand, the costs of refusing the call outweigh the rewards, you're ready for the final step. Commitment. We've covered a lot of ground. Your goal has been drafted, redrafted, refined, finalized, and tested. In short, you've done your due diligence. You've cleared the biggest hurdle. You're ready to begin. That means leaving the planning stage and actually doing the work. Remember, endlessly reworking to-do lists can be a form of pseudo-action. It's a way of tricking yourself into believing that your procrastination is achieving something. The key is to actually move forward. If it's a book you're writing, write it one page at a time. If you're building a community organization, fund it one phone call at a time. Ongoing commitments to small steps of action make the difference. So take the necessary actions. Chances are, you're going to be working on your worthy goal for a while. Depending on your project, it might take months or years or even decades. So it's important to take time out to evaluate your progress. If you want to maintain momentum, it's a good idea to take a break every six weeks. That's enough time to make real progress, but not long enough to rack up serious sunken costs. Take a few days off to evaluate the previous weeks. What are you happy about? What went wrong? Do you want to continue with this project? If so, what's your target for the next six weeks? Breaking your worthy goal down into small chunks like this makes it feel much more achievable. We owe it to ourselves to make the most of our time on this planet. That means doing something that matters. No one can tell you what that might be. You have to decide for yourself. The best way of figuring that out is to set a goal for yourself and put it through a series of tests. Is it thrilling and challenging and important? Do the people who know you best think it's a good idea? Is it better than the status quo? If the answer to those questions is yes, you might just have found a worthy goal. Well, dear listener, you've done it. You just listened to the Blinks to How to Begin by Michael Bungay Stanier. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Well, before you leave, don't forget to subscribe to Books in Blinks and leave your thoughts in the comments section below. Also, check out the other titles in our playlist. I'm Pedro from Books and Blinks, and I hope to see you here again.